This is Arab Talk on KPOO San Francisco, 89.5 FM. This is Arab Talk with Jess and Jamal. I'm Jess Khanem. And this is Jamal Dejani. Jamal, we have a great show today, and I'm really excited about it because we're going to be covering a lot of ground uh, all the way from international uh, politics to domestic politics and everything in between. Where we're going to start today, though, Jamal, is the deal of the century, the Kushner-Greenblatt plan. And I have some interesting news for you about Jared Kushner. Jared Kushner, in the midst of all the turmoil that we're having right now in terms of domestic issues in the United States, is, is with Benjamin Netanyahu in Tel Aviv right now. And there is a bit of a turmoil that's going on. Benjamin Netanyahu had a deadline Thursday night, you know, their time, uh, Palestine time, to form a coalition government. He was unable to form a coalition government, and as a result, there are going to be new elections sometime in August of 2019. I hate to say this, Jamal, I really don't, but I think Benjamin Netanyahu and Jared Kushner are on a sinking ship. It's a sinking ship, and it's going to sink many, many people with it, including the so-called deal of the century. And probably it will affect uh, Donald Trump's re-election campaign because Absolutely. he's putting a lot of uh, you know, investment into the sinking ship like many of his investments, like many of his forests, just like buying the Eastern Airline, which went bankrupt, like his casinos in Atlantic City, which went back, uh, bankrupt. But let's go back a little bit. So exactly, just it's almost exactly to the day, uh, exactly one month after the 21st Israeli Knesset was uh, sworn in, a majority of the Knesset voted yesterday, late at night, uh, Jerusalem time to disperse and initiate an unprecedented repeat election on September 17th. Oh. 17th. So they've already scheduled the date for September. Okay. September. So it was the first time in Israeli history, and this is very important. So the first time in Israeli history that a candidate for prime minister just failed to form a coalition after being given the task by the president after the election. So right. it's, it's, it's not like a, a daily happening. You know, this is totally unprecedented, right? right? And so now they've extended the deadline, basically, right. to have another election. And so, so um, and Benjamin Netanyahu told the Likud, right, that this is his party, ahead of the vote that he had not succeeded in reaching a compromise by your, me, by your favorite friend, the Israel Beituna leader, Avigdor Lieberman. And where was Avigdor Lieberman born, Jamal? Mold he was in the Moldova, former USSR, and he's, by the way, a settler in the West Bank. He lives as in a settlement yeah. so, so in he, the West Bank. He told okay. him that they, he was not able to reach a compromise with uh, Avigdor Lieberman on the contour, controversial Haradi or ultra-Orthodox a conscription bill and that he had also tried unsuccess successfully to woo um, Knesset members from the opposition to join his government. So basically that whole time that they've been spending to form a government basically collapsed, right? Yeah. So taking you back because you started about the so-called deal of the century, Call it whatever you want. I say to, to we, we're actually taking, um, you know, on Twitter, on Facebook, even send us an email and give it a new name. I right? have a new name. So there is the deal of the century. We call it the no deal of the century. And I there is the deal of the next century. That's, I'm going to steal that from Saab at a cat. Yeah, the so there is the deal of the next century. It's the deal of the next century. And so whatever you want to call it, uh, call it. But it looks like it is sinking to the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea with Netanyahu's sinking ship. Well, Jamal, I think that's, uh, that's exactly right. I just want to add a little flavor to your analysis, which is really spot on. Kushner had this pre-planned trip to coalesce support for the Bahrain meeting that's coming up to announce the deal of the century. 
So he had this trip planned for, for a long time. And actually, Mike Pompeo is with him. And we'll get into some of the details of that later. But the plan was to show up his support with MBS, with the leaders in the Gulf, to possibly get more support from Sisi and from King Abdullah of Jordan, and then to meet with Benjamin Netanyahu to put the final touches on the no deal of the century, the deal of the next century, the fake deal, the no deal, whatever you want to call it. Just so happens on the night before Jared Kushner uh, touches down in at the Lid Airport in Tel Aviv, Benjamin Netanyahu is in this catastrophic environment now where it looks like not only is he unable to form a coalition government, but there's every possibility that before that next election, there is a more than 50-50 chance that he could be indicted on charges of bribery, possibly other charges relating to the misuse of funds. So we, we put that on one side. The other kind of issue, Jamal, is that Benjamin Netanyahu is, is trying to align himself with these ultra-right, ultra-orthodox uh, parties that have traditionally been very supportive of Benjamin Netanyahu, led by Avigdor Lieberman. And basically, Lieberman is saying no dice. And the critical issue, or I should say one of the critical issues, has to do with the conscription of ultra-orthodox Israeli Jews into the military. For a long time, the ultra-orthodox uh, have been given a pass because there's mandatory conscription. That's right. Mandatory, you know, after high school two years, you're in the Israeli army basically engaging in war crimes against Palestinians, against refugees, and other things. But the ultra-orthodox are typically given a pass. A lot of Netanyahu supporters are no longer down with that. They want the ultra-Orthodox to be on board. And it seems like Lieberman has got one foot on the dock and one foot on the ship. He's trying to straddle both sides. But without Lieberman, Netanyahu cannot form this coalition well, government. Uh, Lieberman, uh, basically, uh, he's the leader of the whole settler movement now, which is about a million strong just in the West Bank alone. Right. Primarily uh, Russians. Close 900,000 of them. Right. And not to mention the ones who live in the 1948 uh, Israel, uh, t you know, areas. So uh, also he has the support of uh, immigrants from Russia and the former Soviet Union. Right. Without him, without him. He can't do it. He can't do it. And so Lieberman has been manipulating manipulating Netanyahu for the past several months, in fact, before the elections. And he, and then I've been reading through the Israeli media. You know, remember, he was the secretary of, former secretary of defense, which is the second most powerful position, more powerful than the, fo the foreign ministry. By far. And he yeah, was, by far. Uh, and he was a foreign minister. And he was uh, the, uh, also in charge of the housing also. So he had, I mean, all these different portfolios that Netanyahu was offering him to appease to him. It didn't work. And, you know, I mean, it didn't work. It basically... By the way, you know why it didn't work, Jamal? Because guess, guess what? Breaking news. Avigdor Lieberman wants to be prime minister. He wants to dethrone. I mean, I believe that part of the strategy here is that Avigdor Lieberman believes that Netanyahu will be indicted, that he will, you know, have to, not, he'll not be able to run or will run really wounded in the elections in September. And I think secretly Avigdor Lieberman wants to be the prime minister of, uh, of the Israelis. And I think that's what he's gunning for right now. I think because he's putting heavy pressure on it. And this is the first time I've heard Netanyahu actually be extremely critical. I mean, they're using, you know. Well, you know, th this, is the, this is the funny thing, right? So Netanyahu now has been accusing Lieberman of being too liberal. Well, I mean, I mean, think about it. Didn't because, Trump do the same thing? You know, so he's accusing, I mean, Lieberman, I mean, he's someone who's way, I mean, if you, if you, he has a whole history of saying things like the transfer of Palestinians, um, beheading, by the way. Right. Uh, 
um, Palestinian MKs in the Israeli Knesset. Use of torture. Use, uh, you know, accusing them of treason. So now all of a sudden, Netanyahu is saying, hey, you know, the reason this guy is giving me a hard time and he doesn't want to play along is that because he is a, he's he's a, a liberal. He's a liberal. And he's a secular liberal. And Lieberman has been attacking Netanyahu for being controlled by the Haradim, which is the ultra-Orthodox, ultra and that uh, he's a, you know, and that he's a sickening hypocrite himself. I mean, if you read, I mean, it's actually major entertainment. I, I woke up in the morning and I started reading the three major uh, newspapers, you know, not just the Haaretz and Jerusalem Post in English, but it's actually, it's more entertaining to read them in Hebrew, Yidiot Ahranot, and of course, uh, is, uh, Israel Hayom, which is uh, uh, Sheldon Adelson's newspaper. Right. And it's like a big soap opera. Can I ask you a question about that? And yeah, sure. Does that soap opera remind you of anything? Does it sound and have the flavor and have the feeling of a Trump Twitter storm. I mean, the language, if you read even the translations, which I know are not as good as the original Hebrew, but even the translations of some of the back and forth between Netanyahu and Lieberman sound very much like a Trump Twitter attack when Trump has attacked, you know, Nancy Pelosi, when he's attacked, you know, Joe Biden, very vicious, very negative, ad hominem attacks on people. It's, uh, I guess it's no surprise that Netanyahu and Trump are cut from the same cloth when it comes to their political instincts and their political yeah, uh, and maneuver. that's why that's why they've been riding. They love each other. They've been riding on the same boat, and this boat is now sinking. Well, that's that's, and that's why I think it will affect what's happening here in the United States. Absolutely. And this, you know, you, when you were talking about Kushner, Kushner arrived there before these this news you know, had come out. I don't know if they had internal, no. an internal memo saying, you know, guess what? This is there not is the a, best time to a, come. This is not the best time, and there is a high likelihood that Netanyahu won't be here come September or comes October of this year, because uh, we started talking about this last week. The, he's not only talking about the deal of the century. Now they're preparing for the so-called economic conference in Manama, Bahrain. Yeah, in Bahrain. You know, that, that, that whole Joke. jam uh, of, of, a, in a con uh, of a conference. And they have recently succeeded, and this is why a lot is at stake, they've recently succeeded in coercing the Saudis, coercing the UAE. Of course, Bahrain is hosting it. And they've succeeded in bringing along Qatar and one Palestinian businessman no, but who he's not is shunned by the entire community, the Jabari guy from Hebron. He doesn't even live there. Because no, but he's I don't even think, community. I mean, I doubt that he'll even show. No, no, he's, he's, he's the one uh, he's token, the Palestinian. token Palestinian that they will have there. But uh, Kushner has failed to convince King Abdullah of Jordan. The King Abdullah of Jordan or the royal court uh, yesterday issued a very diplomatic kind of uh, slap no, in the face saying no, thank thanks, you. thanks, but no thanks. Thanks, but no thanks. But nevertheless, they were counting on going along because then you have the Israeli side. And now he just so landed Jamal, there into this big right. mess. So Jamal, talking about the big mess, let's let's kind of game this out a little bit. Let me ask, I'll put it in the form of a question, then I'll do a little bit of analysis. How can you have the deal of a century with somebody who may be indicted and may not even be prime minister? Well, that's why it is the deal of the next century. The next century. So not only did the deal itself, because it was based on apartheid, it wasn't based on justice, it didn't solve or address the issue of refugees, it didn't address the issue of the right of return, it didn't address the issues of borders, sovereignty, indivisibility of justice. On the Palestinian side, it did nothing. It just continued the apartheid practices of, of the state of Israel. That, that's just on the Palestinian side. Now we have on the Israeli side, basically the impossibility of the Kushner deal even happening because Netanyahu cannot with any... He cannot deliver. He basically. can't deliver. So Kushner can't deliver. The Palestinians are not involved. And now Netanyahu can't deliver. Well, guess, guess who's the most powerful person in Israel now? 
Avigdor Lieberman. That's my point. Avigdor. He is the most powerful person in Israel, and the, he is the one who can decide. He's the decision maker. He's this, the decider. This <laughs> colonial settler from Moldova is going to decide the fate, not only the Israeli fate, but also the Palestinian fate. Right. And by the way, this is the person uh, that was called a moderate by Netanyahu now, because they kind of now can dance along together. And I just want to give you a brief history of Avigdor Lieberman. This is actually from the Israeli media itself. I don't so have, you're not I don't making, have, you're not making this up. up. You're not making it to, up. I don't, we never make things up, by the way, just we're joking, uh, you know. But, you know, he is, in 2001, you know, he has been, he admitted assaulting a boy. Okay? He, this is actually a scandal within the Israeli media. You know, he assaulted a 12-year-old boy from the settlement of Tikowa. You know, he was bragging about it. In, um, he also bragged about or suggesting the drowning of Palestinian prisoners in 2003. Right. In 2004, Lieberman presented to Russia a plan to expel disloyal Arabs. You know, those are Israeli citizens. In 2006, Lieberman said that Arab MK collaborators should be executed. This is what I was referring. So I'm giving you a timeline, right? In 2009, and this is when he became the new foreign minister, he called, you know, he, he attacked Mubarak and, and kind of almost right. ruined the relationship between Israel and Egypt. In 2013, you know, uh, in 2014, basically, he wanted to pay Israeli Arabs to move to uh, to a Palestinian state. He wanted to transfer the Palestinians to Jordan. In 1940. No, no, to move to the West Bank. Basically. To move to the West Bank. Okay. And in 2015, uh, one of his aides mysteriously disappeared, suspected of money laundering. His name is Michelle, I think, uh, or Michael, uh, Michael Palkov. We don't know what happened to this no, guy. No, we don't know what happened. 2015, Lieberman says disloyal Israeli Arabs should be beheaded. First executed, then beheaded. 2016, Lieberman says he would give Hamas leader Ismail Haniyeh 48 hours to return the bodies of dead Israeli soldiers or be assassinated. 2017, following riots, Israeli defense minister, now his defense minister, calls for the boycott of Arab citizens. They do not, don't belong here, he was telling the Israeli public. 2018, uh, two years on the job, he uh, basically uh, admitted that he was winging it, so he lacked the knowledge, the training, and the influence. There's a whole kind of like history of the way they're describing it. So, and this is in the Israeli media. Right. And this is actually a very Water kind, died. kind description so let me just of say, Avigdor Lieberman, and he's now in, in charge, right. basically. But, Jamal, why don't we just call it what it is? I mean, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's a duck. Avigdor Lieberman walks like a white nationalist. He quacks like a white nationalist. He is a white nationalist. He grew up in being exposed to extreme ultra-nationalism in Moldova as part of the former Soviet Union. He has those tendencies anyways. He's an extremist. He advocates for ethnic cleansing of indigenous Palestinians. And we might even say that's a kind depiction of Avigdor Lieberman. And what is ironic, Jamal, is that you have Benjamin Netanyahu calling this basically white nationalist, white supremacist, Avigdor Lieberman, too liberal. So if that's the version of Israeli liberalism, then what, what is on the right side of that, Jamal? I don't even know what to call whatever is on the right side of... Avigdor Lieberman, who most people consider among the most extreme, most uh, violent inspiring uh, individual in the uh, Israeli Knesset. And as you said, let's not forget, he lives on stolen, illegal Palestinian land uh, in, in a settlement uh, in the West Bank. Like, what is going on 
that this now is the most powerful person in the Israeli government and Jamal, that Donald Trump continues to believe that the that the Israelis are the strongest allies of the United States. And this is, by the way, what Netanyahu said. I'm looking at his uh, words, uh, and he looked very shattered and shaken and angry when he was speaking. And he said, Lieberman is now part of the left. He tricked his voters. He's part of the so left. Part of the left. So, so part of the left is kind of uh, an insult. Uh, in Israel. So now they consider Lieberman part of the left, which, which of course he's not. He's basically manipulating the whole system. But I want to go back now to the so-called deal and no deal of the century because we have been talking about it. We've seen the writing on the wall. It has been crumbling in front of our own eyes and the ship has been sinking. And then thinking about how ludicrous and uh, just ridiculous this, the, the whole concept and those who were left in charge. Right. The deal of the century, which is really Netanyahu's deal. I've said that early on, and I say it again. The entire foreign policy for the Middle East is Netanyahu. It's not Trump's, um, I, I should say. The entire Trump's foreign policy is for Netanyahu. the Middle East is Netanyahu's. Right. And it has been written and delivered, and they have the key players. Look, you have Trump on one side, and you have ben, uh, Bibi Netanyahu on the other side. And in the middle, you have MBS. And no, no. He, MBS, you know what? He's just an asterisk there. Trust me. They tell him to jump. He, he says, how, how high? high? And so... After you, you look at it, you have three people who are now in charge, right, outside the big fellows, Bibi Netanyahu and Donald Trump. Who's the third? You have, no, you have the three. You have Jared Kushner, right, the son-in-law, and let's not talk about nepotism, right? That's, Why? That's, Why talk about it? Let's not talk about it. I'm just, I'm just kidding with you. I'm just saying you have the three players. You have Jared Kushner, the son-in-law. You have Ambassador Greenblatt. Uh, well, uh, no, you have Freeman. Ambassador Freeman, Special Envoy Greenblatt. Yeah, and Special Envoy Greenblatt. Ambassador Freeman is Trump's bankruptcy or former bankruptcy lawyer. Right. Let's get that kind of, let's let, let that think in, <laughs> sink in a little bit. Greenblatt is his former, uh, no, but yeah, uh, uh, Freeman is the bankruptcy Attorney Greenblatt is is his also an attorney, right? His, his, his also his attorney. Per, one of the personal attorneys. Yes. Yeah, one of the business for, personal for attorneys. many for many for many years. Right. So the entire portfolio of the Middle East, because we're not only talking about the deal of the century. This is the deal of the century, kind of like you know the Palestinians are being played like football, right? It's it's this is they're setting the plan for Jordan, Iraq, the Gulf, etc. Those three folks here, his son-in-law, his two former attorneys, they're in charge right. of and this whole policy, and they are best buddies of Bibi Netanyahu. Right. They're the best of best of buddies. So why wouldn't you? Freeman supported settlements for years so before. So don't you believe that they're honest brokers, Jamal? Oh, my well, God. Well, this is this is the <laughs> joke. I mean, this is the joke. I, I say this is the joke of the century, and they were almost there to pull it off within no, a week. No, uh, no, no. I don't believe it. I'm telling you. No, I am I telling you because I, I don't believe it. They just. The, the conference in Bahrain was set up to liquidate the whole Palestinian cause. Absolutely. Without Palestinians, with just a token, whatever, call him, turncoat, anything you want, because I've heard worse things how he's been described by Palestinians. Right. This jabbery businessman there, right? Who doesn't even live in Palestine, right? And you got the key players. You got Saudi Arabia. This is where the money is going to come. Most of the money is going to come from. You got the UAE, you got Qatar, you got Bahrain, and then you got the Israeli side, and then you got the United States, and they'll get some buy-in from some European countries, and they would have liquidated 
the whole Palestinian sure. cause after that conference because the whole plan was to transform a liberation movement into just basically slavery, a real estate transaction. Oh, and I'm sorry, uh, uh, Greenblatt was his real estate attorney. attorney. Right. So it's a real estate transaction. But this is it. I, I agree with about 90% of what you just said, Jamal. The 10% that I don't agree with is that I don't think even had Netanyahu formed a coalition government, I still believe that were plenty of forces that even leading up to Bahrain and the economic summit, which is, you know, as we've talked it's about. It's a liquidation summit. Yeah, it's a liquidation summit. It's just an attempt to make the Palestinians uh, slaves in, in some sort of economic market for the Israelis. It's, it was a big joke. That there were enough forces that would have contributed to the stalling or demise of the deal of the century anyway. So this, I would say, just hastened it. But I do want to go back to one of your points, which I think is really important. We need to spend a lot of time on this. Because you have these three or four individuals Freeman, Greenblatt, Kushner, Netanyahu, Trump, who are forming the basis of the grand strategy in the Middle East. And they're playing a very d dangerous game, Jamal. And a dirty game. Well, it's always been dirty. The, the, the politics of Palestine from the United States has always been dirty. It got even dirtier under uh, Donald Trump. But here's where they're making a really bad mistake, Jamal. It's the play with Iran. We mentioned it last week. We need to keep bringing it up. The drumbeat of the rhetoric coming from Donald Trump sounds catastrophically similar to the drumbeat that we heard leading up to the invasion and destruction of Iraq in 2003 and 2004. You have similar players. You have John Bolton. You have Donald Trump, who waxes and wanes on this. Sometimes he's bellicose when it comes to Iran. Sometimes he says, oh, we don't want. But what they are doing with Iran, they're putting more economic pressure, they're squeezing the Iranians, and they are making a grotesque miscalculation if they believe that the Iranians will submit in the same way that what happened to Iraq in 2004 with that invasion. They are making a catastrophic miscalculation. Now, some people say, Jamal, and this is kind of like the Condoleezza Rice theory of the Middle East, you know, let it all burn. Who cares about the Middle East anyways? Some people are saying that this is an attempt to destabilize yet again the entire region. And let's remind our listeners about what happened the last time Iraq Afghanistan and the region was destabilized, gave birth to ISIS, uh, gave birth to Al-Qaeda, gave, well, re-energized re Al-Qaeda rather, but gave birth to ISIS and other very extreme organizations. So the idea that somehow this is going to lead to the destabilization of Iran, I think is one of the most grotesque miscalculations that Donald Trump and John Bolton are engaging with right now. And frankly, given what they did in Syria, Jamal, giving away illegally the Golan Heights, um, I think that with this falling apart of the deal of the century, it creates the possibility, Jamal, of more destabilization. Well, it's all connected. That's why I, when I talk about, you know, this whole foreign policy, it's the foreign policy now they're focusing. I mean, if you look at the foreign policy focus of the Trump administration. Right. He keeps North Korea, like this is his fantasy. He's going to transform this dictator into this uh, cuddly, cuddly teddy bear or whatever that Americans are going to hug. We'll see about that, right? Then the other part is really the Middle East. And the Middle East, you know, initially they start with this deal of the century, let's resolve the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. But it's really not about the resolving the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. It's about liquidating the Palestinian and cause. And institutionalizing and then, apartheid, and yeah. And then creating a new coalition, just like the coalition they've created against Iraq. And now the new coalition, led by Saudi Arabia, and that's why MBS is just like an agent. He's just like someone who is going to, you know, Trump is going to tell him, we want one, two, three out of the, uh, from you, and he's going to deliver on this. And so that meeting, the economic meeting, that's also bringing this coalition, right? 
this coalition to kind of set the plans or set the motion to basically do something about Iran. Now, has it uh, transitioned into a military action? Well, we don't know yet because Trump, you're right, he's been kind of waffling as far as but, this. But they're squeezing. They're, they're squeezing, squeezing economically. But someone like Bolton, this is the joke, and I'm going to, someone like Bolton, and, and I'm, I'm sorry maybe to our listeners, but people, most people have short-term memory. This is the guy who supported the whole invasion of Iraq based on the lie of the century back then that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction. And now, just yesterday, just Bolton said that there was some prospect that evidence, some, this is how we started, some prospect it's bogus. that evidence Iran was behind attacks this month on oil tankers in the Gulf. And these are his exact words. I don't think anybody who's familiar with the situation in the region, whether they have examined the evidence or not, has come to any conclusion other than these attacks were carried out by Iran or their surrogates. So there's a new concoction now. The new co by the way, they're not talking as much uh, about Iran's nuclear uh, you know, no, because program. They're saying they're saying basically Iran is a bad actor and it has been attacking oil tankers. And therefore we must take action. Yeah. I think it's this as I said, it's so the it's same the rhetoric. Setup. Yeah. Listen, the Iranians are very smart. They understand the rhetoric. The comments coming from their foreign minister, Zarif, and the, uh, the grand uh, Ayatollah uh, Khamenei have been very strong. They basically, they basically said, we're not going to be intimidated by you. We're not going to be threatened by the United States. And, you know, keeping in mind, Jamal, that Iran, out of the entire region, has the most formidable military infrastructure and apparatus of any country in the region by far, by far, by far. And uh, they're very sophisticated. And I'd like to remind everybody that, you know, Iran's reach in terms of its influence in the region extends well beyond Iran itself. We know that it extends to Syria. We know that it extends to uh, Lebanon. That's why they're playing a very dangerous game. So when this ship, Jamal, goes down, and I do believe that the Netan, this was one of my predictions, as you know, at the beginning of the year, basically I said the Netanyahu ship would go down. When Netanyahu ship goes down, the Kushner ship will go down with it. And Kushner has problems both with the deal of century as well as Kushner Properties LLC. So he's going to be in trouble too. Once Trump is out of office, Trump is going to is on a sinking ship, I believe, and I absolutely believe that eventually that ship is going to sink. What we're seeing, unless there's some adults in the room with some leadership, we're seeing the possibility of some really large scale global destabilization yet again in the Middle East, which would be catastrophic, especially if it involves Iran. So here's the question. Then. Sure. And the question is basically, you know, how badly did Trump gamble on Netanyahu? He gambled everything. Thing. He gambled the whole house. He put everything on this it. This whole thing. He and, doubled and, and, down. And, and 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 this is why I keep going back to that. This the this the so-called deal of the century and the sinking ship will also bring down not only Netanyahu but will also bring down Donald Trump Absolutely. ahead of the Trump the Mueller investigation. Well, that let's and just this is what this is where we, we're going to go next. Because right. But you're listening to Arab Talk on KPOO San Francisco, 89.5 FM. This is Arab Talk with Justin Jamal. We're streaming live on Facebook Live at Jamal Dejani 2. We're streaming, audio streaming live on KPOO.com. And Jamal, I have an interesting factoid f for you. Okay. Sin it? Since we're talking about the Mueller report. That's what I want to hear. We're talking about the Mueller report. The pressure for impeachment, the volume and the pressure has just been raised dramatically. 
I what, mean, I can't keep up with Trump tweets. No, I can't. But I just want to say that if you look at the two Congress people, one Democrat and one Republican, who on the Republican side who have advocated. Uh oh, I know where you're going. <laughs> I know where you're going. Who have advocated for the impeachment of Donald Trump. We're talking about Justin Amash. And on the side of the Democrat Party, the first congressman to put forth a bill promoting the process of initiating impeachment of Donald Trump, which is Rashida Tlaib. Interesting thing between Rashida Tlaib well, and Justin Amash. Hold on. Most hold people know half of the story. Yeah. Most people know that uh, Rashida Tlaib is Palestinian. What they don't know is Justin Amash is Palestinian, too. So I, it's interesting in terms of the, you know, Netanyahu bringing down Trump. It's just interesting to think that the two people who are spearheading on the Republican and Democratic side, the impeachment of Donald Trump, to facilitate that sinking ship, both of whom have Palestinian roots. Yeah, Justin, Justin, Justin Amash is a Republican. Uh, From Michigan. And he was born in Michigan. Right. But what's his district? It's in Michigan, Michigan. Grand Rapids, yeah. Okay. And uh, his uh, father is Palestinian uh, immigrant, and his mother is a Syrian immigrant to the United States. But Justin is a very Palestinian name, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> well, and then uh, Rashida Tlaib, everyone basically knows she's know, Palestinian. They know, and she doesn't hide that, and she wears her thob, Palestinian thob. But I was actually surprised because I actually, I myself didn't know initially that he is um, the uh, child of uh, Palestinian Syrian uh, immigrants to the United States. Yes. And also that he is breaking ranks with his own party, the Republican Party, and not only like criticizing Trump, but he's calling for his impeachment. Right. And this is very powerful. So just, Justin Amash is uh, from a district in Grand Rapids. He held a town hall. It was very interesting this week. After he came out now, the interesting thing about Justin Amash, besides being Palestinian-American, um, the other interesting thing about Justin Amash is that he fancies himself as a Tea Party Republican. He fancies himself as really much more on the libertarian side, which many people in Michigan are. Uh, I'm from Michigan. I know a little bit about Michigan. And um, he, thirdly, he did one thing that I can honestly say is he might, in fact, be the only Republican that did this one thing. He read the entire Mueller report, Jamal. He read the entire 400-page-plus Mueller report. So he knows it inside out. He knows it. And after he finished it, he looked, him, he looked himself in the mirror and said, oh, my God, this guy is a complete liar, fabricator. He committed impeachable defenses. He obstructed justice. And he played footsie with the Russians. And he said, basically, in good conscience, it doesn't matter if I'm a Republican or whatever, we need to get rid of this guy. We need to impeach him. He's, you know, basically a threat to what we believe uh, is our institutions of democracy. When he said that at his town hall, Jamal, he got a standing ovation. Now, after the standing ovation, he took questions from the audience. And two people with MAGA hats <laughs> stood up, and they just... Went berserk. Oh, they ripped him. They ripped him. So he put re really his whole career on the line. Well, there's already a... a no, the Trump, the Republican National Committee, uh, they've already found someone to run against him in 2020. He's going to be challenged. Now, the good news is the majority of people who live in his district, I mean, he's, this is his third term, I think. So he's, he's an incumbent. He's going to have a tough... And I think he's respected no, in the party. No, he, I mean, he's deeply respected. But being the first Republican to, to come out is a big deal. Now, I have a prediction for you. You know, I like predictions. What do you think the odds are that they will now call him out for being Palestinian, that he came well, up to you've, them. you've already outed him, Jess. You're the Michigan. <laughs> you're from Michigan. You're from the same state. The same tribe. And... Yeah. Uh, well, one thing he never actually, uh, unlike, like I said, unlike, no, he doesn't. He doesn't identify Ra Rashida, with it. No. Rashida Tlaib, he doesn't identify. You know that oh, I'm, my father is uh, from Palestine, whatever. 
And so he doesn't talk about this issue. But it will come up. Of course it's going to come up. It's already has come up, you know. And they're trying to figure a way how to attack him because he actually, he, he has never been like on the critical side of Israel or things like this. I looked at his record. No, he's very pro-Israel. Yeah, so, so this is the thing. He's not, he's, he kind of has been towing the line of the Republican establishment for all these years. Yeah. And then now, all of a sudden, he's anti-Trump. And they're going to try to dig some stuff. So and when they dig when him. they dig stuff up on him, Jamal. Well, I mean, uh, the f he got attacked, by the way, by Trump, but he didn't mention his uh, ethnicity. He attacked him immediately, right? Just like he attacked. We're talking since we're talking about uh, Robert Mueller today. Trump tweeted. This is what Robert Mueller. Uh, what Trump tweeted today. Robert Mueller came to the Oval Office seeking to be named the director of the FBI. He had already been in that position for 12 years. I told him no, capital N, capital O. The next day he was named special counsel, a total conflict of interest. Nice. You know, this is Trump's way of saying that well, I have, is corrupt. I, 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 I actually have news for uh, Donald Trump that I believe that Robert Mueller's press conference yesterday was the beginning of the end. Not the end of the beginning, because we were still in the beginning phase. But what we did see yesterday and heard from Robert Mueller for the first time in over two years is the beginning of the end. Because what Robert Mueller did yesterday was essentially um, call Donald Trump a liar. He called the Attorney General William Barr a liar. He called them out. He made, he made it clear and unequivocal that the only reason he did not indict Donald Trump was because of the OLC memo. He said, and this was the most amazing thing, we knew this, but having him say it was important. Uh, the reason we didn't indict uh, uh, Donald Trump is because of the OLC memo. We did not exonerate Donald Trump, but we could not indict him because of the OLC. If we had found him clear of obstruction, we would have said so. He's basically, he, he threw the ball in Congress court, right? Yeah. To basically like, these are the limitations. My hands were tied. I couldn't indict him. He's not innocent, as he, he was not saying. Innocent. He's not innocent. But you have now the duty to answer to the American people, no, and you but, can take yeah. him, he basically. Said, he said, I cannot indict him. I can exonerate him, and he basically said, as I said, if he were cleared, if I could have exonerated, I would have. I couldn't. But I can't indict because of the OLC, Office of Legal Counsel memo. So therefore, as he said, there are other mechanisms that's code for, hey, Congress, the ball, as By you the said, way, uh, uh, just for the record, he's a lifelong Republican. Republican. You know, that's of course. when, you know. Uh, anyway, there is a whole list, actually, that was made uh, trying to kind of read through uh, Mueller's press conference and all the lies that pretty much it uncovered uh, from Donald Trump, like saying that there was, you know, Trump keeps saying there is no crime, there is no crime, and this is not what Mueller no. said. He said right? if there was no crime, I would have said so. Yeah, so, so that kind of debunks. I committed no crime. He said no obstruction. No obstruction, none of that. He, they actually found evidence of obstruction. Yeah, yeah so, so. There were 11 instances, Jamal, in the Mueller report. I actually read this part. This is in the second volume. There were 11 instances where Trump attempted to obstruct justice. He told the White House lawyer, Don McGahn, basically to fabricate, um, you know, a memo saying that he never obstructed justice when, in fact, he had. He asked Don McGahn to fire Robert, Robert Mueller. I mean, all these attempts, he asked people to lie. I mean, multiple, multiple attempts. And Mueller said yesterday, asking people to lie to the special counsel basically cuts at the fabric of our constitutional right. democracy. And when that happens, we need to, as Americans, we need to take issue with that. The other thing that, that Mueller said that I think is really important, which we have forgotten, he said, hey, the Russians really messed yeah. with the 2000. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Even, even Trump said that and he retracted. He I tweeted. Know. He said, yeah, it had nothing to do with the, the Russians. 
meddling, you know, getting me elected. And then, by the way, he deleted that tweet. I know he deleted that he tweet. He deleted it. But going back to Mueller, which is really important, Jess, is the fact now you have all now the evidence in a way that puts it in the hands of Congress. I don't see this major urgency from um, Nancy Pelosi to start an impeachment. Wait, I was going to ask you that question, Jamal. Why not? Because I think this is the main, this is the main po political question that's before Nancy Pelosi right now is she's getting a lot of pressure from, um, from her party. The leadership has, the leadership of the Democratic Party caucus has been firm in supporting Nancy Pelosi, but the people in the trenches of the Democratic Party, all of the 40 additional congressmen and women who got elected, as well as the bulk of the Democrats in the Congress, I put pressure to put forward, go forward with the impeachment process. Nancy Pelosi was in San Francisco yesterday, Jamal, right. speaking at the Commonwealth Club, and she basically said the same thing. We have to we have to gather our information. We're not going to go forward she's, with she's impeachment. Being, she's being very cautious. But why? She's being very cautious because it's time consuming. So it might be a distraction for the party for the election. So until maybe maybe late uh, in the election game. I mean, th this is the issue we've been also talking about. It. The Democrats have so many ca candidates. I've lost count of them. And so at this point, to start an impeachment process, it might take the spotlight from, but Jamal, away so from what? these candidates. But so what? Well, if the objective, what's the objective of the impeach, uh, impeachment? Well, Getting rid of Trump? No. Let, you could get rid of him through impeachment, which is a very time-consuming okay, process. Okay. Or you could go to the polls. It's only two years away from now. And put your best foot forward, okay, let me which give you they are not now. They're cannibalizing each other, bringing Biden late in the game, sure. going after Bernie sure. Sanders. Sure. I don't know what who's going to be. Sure. You know, but are let they me give throw you Bernie Sanders under the bus. The same thing they did. That they will. They will. They will. Well, then they're not going to win. OK, but I've already predicted that Donald Trump might win again. So but let me give you the counter argument for impeachment. OK. The counter argument is this, Jamal, which is this is not a political calculation, that rather this is about holding people accountable within a system of justice that we have in the United States. And if you don't impeach, if you don't at least create the process of impeachment, you're sending a message to Donald Trump and all future despots and, you know, uh, people who have these despotic tendencies and these tendencies toward monarchical rule, who like the concept of a monarchy, who act with impunity in a negative way, who act illegally, who put the constitutional processes that we have in this country at great peril. If you don't impeach, then you put the very basis for our democratic uh, institutions in jeopardy. The question, put as simply as possible, why should they let Donald Trump get away with murder? Why should they let Donald Trump get away with this and not at least initiate the process of impeachment? Yes, of course, it'll never happen in the Senate. They'll never convict him, but at least they need to hold him accountable. What say ye to that as the counter argument? It's not My a counter argument. The Democrats are disorganized. They have few months because you can't wait to the last year. They have to get their act together within the next 12 months. Right. They have to identify a strong candidate. They have to put an agenda. I don't see an agenda. They're all over the place. Right. You know, you can use the elements of impeachment and you can use all the facts about Donald Trump, you know, his lying, his uh, deal of the century that's going to fail, anything in your power. But if you're not, if they are not united and if they don't have the proper candidate, they are going to lose, like you've predicted. <laughs> and we're going to be stuck with Donald Trump for another six years. And if you think the first two years were horrible, wait until when Donald Trump does not have to worry about re-election. So the next term, I don't know, it's going to be Donald Trump is just going to have a field day in basically shredding the Constitution, shredding your constitutional rights page by page. 
Okay, so to our Arab Talk listeners, we've, we've just laid out the two strategies. One is a political analysis, which says, and I'll just put your analysis in as simple terms as possible, Jamal. You're saying that the analysis about impeachment or not is a political analysis, and the cost of doing impeachment is too costly, and that the bigger... It's not that it's costly. It's, no, that it's, we should focus on beating Donald Trump at all costs. I That's think you, the could analysis. Have, you could have... The threat of impeachment hanging there. I think it's more important. He doesn't care. He doesn't care. He well, doesn't care. Do you I, think? Do you think he's? Do you think he's going to care when he is? The process is going. He's going to be. It's going to be. He's going to. He's going. It's going to be a call to rally his supporters, those who wear the MAGA Possib- hats, possibly to come out in the millions. That's only 33 percent. And the Democrats are going to put their feet in cold water, thinking that, oh, maybe we, we don't have to fight him hard during the election. So Arab- maybe we don't have to vote because we're going to impeach him. So if they're going, if they're putting their eggs in the basket of impeachment, they can kiss that basket goodbye I say, because they will be stuck with Donald Trump. The, the answer is figure out who is your best candidate, and it's not Joe Biden. Okay. That's the key word for me, and I'm not going to endorse anyone, but it's not Joe Biden. Well, you've Biden. just endorsed possibly 19 other people and, or 23 and, other people. And, and put your best strategy forward to kind of... Get out so, the uh, vote and re, re get back. You know those states that you you've lost. I don't think we, that don't, Obama won. No, I don't figure think that'll way work. How to get that? I say I say hold them accountable. Okay. okay, Arab talk, listeners, cast your votes. Well, okay, I have a challenge for you. Okay. By the time we come to elections, Donald Trump is not going to get impeached. That's my prediction. Well, I believe he could be impeached, but he won't be convicted. And on that sobering note, hey, thanks for listening us, listening to us today on Arab Talk. Right, Jamal? People can listen to us in a lot of different places. We're right here on Arab Talk, KPOO, San Francisco, 89.5 FM. Go to our website, arabtalkradio.com, to subscribe to our free podcast. Is on, it free still? It's free. You know, it's free. We're, we're just giving it away, Jess. <laughs> arabtalkradio.com. <laughs> And, of course, we welcome all, uh, all of our viewers on Facebook Live. So talk to you next week. We'll see you next week.